that we were both young studs, and now we're uh, and now we're old studs. <laughs> oh, glory! Well, it's so good to be uh, be with y'all, and I just always have enjoyed my time here. Jerry, been it was amazing for many years. Every time I showed up, it was at a it was at a like a, uh, one of those monumental moments, you know, uh, when properties were bought, and it was just amazing to how the Lord allowed us to be here and be part of, and it's a blessing to see what what Father has done uh, and, and continues to do. Uh, sure, and enjoyed already hearing somebody that has the perspective of Jesus like I do. I don't. I don't know about you all, but this effeminate Catholic Jesus that they've shown us in movies all of our lives, uh, I, 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 I'm serious, I could never, ever identify with him. I'm not like that. Uh, so, you know, a little soft-spoken. And, and I watched this one where Jerry, he turns over the table. He comes, it's like, he, 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 like, he just flicks something on the table, and I'm, I'm like, do you realize that there was a temple guard that their whole, and these are military men, trained soldiers, their whole job there was to protect all of that industry and business going on. And these guys stood down because of one man and his, <laughs> one man with authority, and, 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 and he was mad. And they and they didn't do anything, and they probably were going. They were going to have to answer for having done nothing. Uh, so he was no, he was no, he was no wimp. One of the things I've always liked about this church is uh, being w women and men are able to be women and men. And uh, your pastor uh, celebrates his manhood and and honors uh, honors godly men and. Uh, Living as godly men, not not uh, not trying to be something we ain't, amen. And glorifying our Father in the in the process. Well, I'm gonna unpack some things here tonight for you real quick. Um, you know, there's some verses in the Bible. There's a bunch of them that mess you up when you really look at them, and when you look at the implications of what they say. And uh, I'm amazed at how little those verses get into most messages anymore. Uh, you know, I hear a lot of messages, and, and they're, they're pretty. And, you know, they all start with S, or they all start with P, or, you know, each point. Uh, and, and at the end of it, I'm like, but where, where's the words of Jesus? Where's the heart of the Father in this? It's, you know... Uh, where 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 am I being called up to something you know to something more, and uh, and I'm not saying there's not a time for those for those sermons, but uh, we need to. Th this is a serious thing we're about here, and I love something I always heard, you know, Jerry say. He says, you know, what we do here matters for eternity, and and we need to. That that needs to be a focus. We're only here for a little while. This is not our home. The Bible tells us very clearly we're to have a mindset that this isn't our, our final destination. We're not to love it too much. We're not to store up too much and, and to focus on it too much because we're, we're, we're going through here, and the real deal starts later, but it's based on what we've done, what we've done here. So uh, first verse I'd like to, and this is this kind of the set up the other three, but Romans 8, 14 says, the sons of God are those that are led of the Spirit. Are led of the Spirit. You know, so much of the, the, the preaching and teaching you grow up, we, have, we become, and don't misunderstand me here, I'm not going off into heresy, but we're so black and white, word-focused. And the Bible never says the sons of God are led by this black and white book. It's there. And it's important. But you better be led of the Spirit as you get into that black and white, or you can end up with also. I mean, look at all the crazy cults and crazy doctrines and winds of doctrines, and, and they all start and, and, and they arrive at things because they're not led of the Spirit. 
and 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 they're certainly uh, uh, you know they they get off all crossways with especially the spirit of, uh, and what Jesus preached, you know. And if you're not careful, if you don't listen to the words of Jesus and and base your base your life on what he taught, you can get off in a whole lot of crazy a whole lot of crazy stuff. Uh, first time I heard Mike Mele said that his ministry, he and his wife, they strive to do everything based on the 49 commands of Christ. And I always, as a kid, you know, because Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. I'm like, oh. but he didn't go around commanding. But when you start reading the Gospels, he gave us a lot of instruction slash commands. And there's 49 of them. I Googled it, and there is 49, some even extended to 52, principles about how we should live, how we should think, and how we should, how we should minister. And, um, and, and, and I'm shocked anymore at how little we hear about what Jesus said and how more, you know, we, we become more Paulanity sometimes in Christianity. Uh, and I'm not taking anything away from Paul, but I want to know what Jesus said about things, you know? And um, so you got to be led of the Spirit. Now, the first verse I want to touch tonight, and, and understand me, if, if I was a pastor of a church, and when I have been, uh, I, I would take each of these three points and spend probably a month or two. I just keep going with each point until I thought I had exhausted it. I'm not, obviously not going to get to do that tonight, okay? So don't, 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 don't panic. But the first one is without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11. It is not hard. It's not unlike, it's impossible to please God. Now, where most preachers make a mistake on, on verses like this, they try now, then they try to tell you what you're supposed to believe about faith and how, and, and, and there's a place for that. And there, but can I tell you something? When you are led of the Spirit and you arrive at revelation and understanding because the Holy Spirit brought you illumination about a, a particular verse or word of God, there's life in that. Yes, there, there's the mystery of preaching, and we need to hear the, the teaching and the, the preaching gifts and the ministry gifts. But I, I have found that if folks, if I can just kind of crack the door open and say, you know, there's some light on the other side of that door. If you'll just go through that door and start looking, you'll find out some really neat things. Well, that's what I want to kind of do for you tonight is just say, listen, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So do you think that you need to have the Holy Spirit lead you into a personal understanding of what faith looks like in your life? What do you think? And because it says... That, that, and here's what faith is. You have to believe that he is and that he rewards. And can I tell you something? Sometimes, I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I live like he isn't. I think that he, he don't see or he don't hear. You know what I'm saying? A lot of our stupid little sins if we really in that moment believe that he is and, and that he's rewards, and the flip side of rewards is he punishes, uh, would we do some of the knuckleheaded things we do? Would we find ourselves in some of the situations that we would find ourselves in if we really believe that he exists, that he sees, and that, like Pastor Jerry always says, what we do here count matters for eternity. Yeah, I learned something from you in all these years. At least one thing I got, I got from it. But, but you see what I'm saying? It's impossible, please. And all of the other things that we do and why we do them and these next couple verses has to grow out of, of that first one, that you believe he is and that he rewards and he's a rewarder. Because let me tell you something. Paul said it best. He said, if there ain't no resurrection, we're the miserable, most miserable of all people. Why? Because if, 
we, we say no like Moses did. He said he forsook the pleasures of sin for a season because he could see the invisible. He could see the, 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 the true reality. And folks, if we're going to live Christ-centered, Christ-glorifying lives, we're going to say no to a lot of fun things. It, it, a lot of and, and even good things and and there's you know there's a lot of things that we'll say no to that aren't in of themselves sin but they're not productive for us and there's a lot of things that consumes our time and our life and our focus and our desires that aren't productive for eternity amen so we have to we have to focus on the fact that 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 to 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 fulfill those things that Jesus has commanded us to do and to and to give the energy and the focus because living living a Christian life is not an easy thing. There's a lot of distractions. Hey, we got all this junk in us that is human junk and ways of thinking and pulling on us. And to fight that, to dominate that, to bring that in under subjection, and to get, make make Jesus Lord of that, you better believe. That God exists and that He's a rewarder, or you ain't going to do pay the price to do that. Would you agree? So without faith, it is impossible to please. We must believe He exists and that He rewards. Romans 14 23 says, Everything that does not originate and proceed from faith is sin. Wow. There's that's a kind of a sister verse to that. Everything that does not originate and proceed from faith is sin. Do you know what that means to our lives? That means about just about everything that we do needs to be measured by the Holy Spirit. And we need, and, and I think when Paul says to be praying continually, that, that's in this, we, we develop a mindset that we're in co communication with the Lord about just about everything. I mean, you know, and, and that's not easy to do because we're knuckleheads sometimes, you know, and, and, and we, something wells up in us and we want to say something and we say it and then we spend the next month trying to undo what we just said because we weren't led of the Spirit. We didn't do it in faith. We did it out of, out of flesh and out of carnality and it produced sin and it produces, and it produces destruction. So everything that does not originate and proceed from faith is sin. Secondly, Hebrews 12, 12 through 14 says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Not to please God. Without, uh, I'm sorry, without holiness, no one will see the Father. So without faith, it's impossible to please him. Without holiness, nobody's going to see him. So do you think holiness is an important thing? Do you think you need to get with the Holy Spirit? And, and, and here's, here's a prayer that always is answered affirmatively. When you ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, teach me, because that is one of the roles of the Holy Spirit was to make everything known to us. Not Bible school and not just preachers and teachers. The Holy Spirit is there to teach us and to lead us into all truth. So when you ask the Holy Spirit, would you please teach me what faith is? Can I tell you something? Father's going to get, get active, make sure that that happens for you. When you want to find out what holiness is, and see, the problem is, at this point, I grew up in a tradition. It was, it was a, a Wesleyan holiness, so it was the holiness, like the Pentecostal holiness, just no tongues, you know, same legalism. And, and, and they, rather than... than Tell people, go to, go to the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to teach you what holiness is. They came up with a whole list of things, external things that proved that you were holy. And I had a granddaddy, and, he, and, and, no, and no disrespect or dishonor to him. He was formed by the system he was in. But he thought he was completely sanctified, Jerry, and holy. And you know what his, how he, he knew? There's a, a list of things that he didn't do. He didn't smoke he didn't drink he didn't chew he didn't go to r-rated movies he didn't play oh god forbid you had a, a deck of playing cards in the house or or play billiards and so there was this whole list 
and it was all external. And can I tell you something, folks? Yeah, you know, as, as the Holy Spirit matures us, there's a whole lot of that stuff that disappears out of our life and as, we, as we're cleaned up by the Spirit. But you can do all of that without the Spirit. I mean, there's, there's Buddhist monks and all sorts of crazy religious monks around the world. They deny themselves all sorts of stuff in error. And they don't do any of those things. And Jesus said to, to the Pharisees of their time, you're really great on the outside. You're, your outside is really clean. You're wash, whitewashed tombs, but you're full of dead men's bones. So holiness, folks, is a whole lot. I'm not saying it excludes those things on the outside, but though it, it isn't just about that. It's about what's on the inside. So, and, and so that we, we don't fall into that category of being like those Pharisees. What produces holiness? And I think biblically, you have to look and say that, that love produces holiness. Paul said, without love, I can do all of this stuff. I, and I mean, and it's quite a list of stuff. I can give myself to the flames to, and die a martyr's death. And if I do it without love, it serves me nothing. So if we're, again, if we're believing that what we do now counts for eternity and we want stuff to count for eternity, we better be doing what we're doing now in love. And in Matthew 22, 34 to 40, uh, let, well, let, let, let's go there because this is really, really important. Matthew 22, verse 34. And on hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert of the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now listen to this. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now what's he saying? Love, Father, with all your heart, mind, soul, and body. And, and that is manifested in that you love your neighbor as yourself. That comes down to love. You, you know, and, and, and John, uh, for, I think it's first John says, how can you love Say that you love God who you cannot see when you don't love your brother that you do see. And so, and, and, and all of the law of the prophets hangs on this. Why? Because if you're busy loving God and loving those that he so loved that he gave his only begotten son, guess what you ain't doing, Pastor Jerry? You ain't breaking the Ten Commandments on them folks. You're not committing adultery. You're not lusting after your neighbor's wife or any of his stuff. You're not doing all of, you know, all of the things uh, that, that the commandments say. And that's why it all, it all hangs on those two. Because you, you really don't even need to know the dot and tittles of those rules if you're focused in on, on loving. And if you're, and see again, both of those two verses for that to happen, you have to believe he is and that he rewards. So you have to have faith to say, you know what? I'm going to love him with all my heart because he exists and he rewards those in eternity for what they do now. And what he's looking at now isn't this list of external stuff. Now, let me tell you, when you start loving people, the external stuff happens. And I, you watch people when they get saved, if, if the, the first thing the church does is start telling them the, the stuff they got to, to, to stop doing, Jerry, you know what happens? Those people very quickly become bitter Christians because at some point you realize that, that, that just stopping sinning, there, there's not a lot of fulfillment in just stopping sinning. There has to be something more than just, and, and what I found when, when you get people focusing in on loving their neighbor as themselves and they begin 
to see their life in the context that they're pleasing their Heavenly Father by loving the folks that He's put in front of you to love, and you care about them. And now your life and all that you do begins to revolve around that reality. And see, the, our reality isn't this world. What you are, the work you do, that isn't your identity. That's what, that's what Father uses to pay the bills so that you can represent him as an ambassador on this planet and love and love him. And, and that, that whole thing of being an ambassador ties into this and, and, and into, into point three. And point three is this. Friendship with the world is enmity with God, James 4.4. 4. Ouch. Now, this, again, is where I think the church is messed up and most preachers mess up because then they start to tell you all the things on their list of friendship with the world. And can I tell you, when anybody starts telling me about all the stuff they do, I, I want to go take a little closer look at their life. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, it, it's like the ones, that, you know, they, oh, don't smoke because you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. But, dude, you, you, you're 60 pounds overweight. So you don't smoke, but you stuff food down your pie hole, and you're going to die an early death, and you're going to kill the temple. You know what I'm saying? And, I, and you look at me. You know I, weight is, my, is one of my, <laughs> and I, I love to eat. So I'm not talking bad about anybody uh, on weight. I'm just saying we all are trying to work through these, these things. And so if, if, if the pastor stands up there and he begins telling you what friendship with the world looks like, you want to be just a little careful with that. Because here's what I'm telling you. I'm not going to give you the list. I'm not going to say what it looks like. I'm not going to tell you. you. You know who needs to be telling you what friendship with the world looks like? And if you have become a friend of the world and have become at enmity with your father, you need the Holy Spirit. And that's why when Paul talks about praying continually, it's an ongoing dialogue with the Lord. Lord, should I do this thing? Should I watch this thing? Should, you know, and so you develop a, a sensitivity of communion and communication with the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit is regulating and leading and guiding you and what you do. Because it's not just what you do. I think it's the reason that you do it. Do, do you, you know, I mean, one of the things I love about Jerry, he, and, and this church is the men do menly things. They hunt and they fish and they, they enjoy motorbikes and they enjoy you know, cars and, and all of that. And guess what? I think that gives glory to the Father unless that begins to own you, okay? So why, why do we do the things? What is the motive? And, and, and is, that, is, is all my pleasure in the things of this world, is all the value, in the, the, the things of this world? And, you know, and, and kind of what I tell people is a good way to kind of, kind of if you want to kind of judge yourself in, in this, have I become a friend with the world? You know, what is... Ask yourself, what is my life producing? If I look at my heathen neighbor and I do the same things they do, I value the same things they do, I treasure the same things they do, I do the same things for fun that they do, and, 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 and there's no difference except that I go to church. Because I had a young man just tell me, because I got on him because... I don't know what you see down here, but I'm seeing young Christian men. They and they, they claim to be Christians, and yet, man, they f bomb and gd this and f this, and you're sitting with them, and you're like, "Holy mackerel!" You know, I'm not a I'm not a prude, stuck in the mud guy, but uh, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and I asked this young guy Tommy that I said, Tommy, I said, man. I mean, I was getting on him a little bit about it. I said, because the Bible does talk about the stuff that comes out of our mouth and vulgarity and things. And, and I asked him, I said, Tommy, what in your life, if somebody was looking for evidence to say that you were a Christian, 
What in your life is proof that you're a Christian? And you know what he told me? I go to church. And I happen to know he goes to church maybe twice a month. So his, his defining between him and the lost heathen world was that he shows up to church twice a month for a little 20-minute sermonette. I know the church he goes to as well. And that was his definition of, 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 of being guilty of being a Christian. Well, I think he's friend with the world. And I think he's in enmity with God because what's being produced in his life if, if, if he's trying to store up stuff for eternity, he's in trouble, I would say. What do you think? Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Are you brave enough to ask the Holy Spirit to unpack that for you? And do you love the Father enough and do you love people enough that when he starts putting his finger on certain things and says, you know what, this thing has become an issue. It's not in and of itself, it's not sin, but it's not good for you. Your motives for doing it, the time, the, uh, the quantity of time it takes from you. And see, I'm not, I, I, I'm, I'm with y'all. I, I think this is a beautiful planet that God's put us on, and there's a lot of neat things and I don't think he has any problem with us enjoying it. But when we begin to love it more than we love him, yeah. and we begin to see it as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, an end unto itself, you know, I, 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 I got a really great lesson from my, my granddaddy at his funeral. And um, he, got, he didn't get saved till he was 45 years old. He was a rough, heathen man before that. Became the best man that I've ever met. I mean, literally overnight from the time he got saved. It was just an absolute transformation. And you talk about a holy man. And you know what? He continued to do recreationally all the things that he had always done. He continued to hunt. He continued to fish. He continued to go clamming. He continued to go crabbing. But you know what changed? Now as he was doing that, he was attentive to the Holy Spirit that in the context of doing those things, that he was an ambassador of Christ, that people were watching him, and that when he would intersect with individuals while he was doing those things, and he would lead them to the Lord. At his funeral, we had, we had an open mic where people, and, and this, the church was packed. And this is just a simple little seventh-educated, grade-educated Italian immigrant. No, it worked for the state highway, never did nothing flashy in, in life. And at his funeral, the line to get to that, that microphone was stretched out the back of the church. And one after the other, people came up and said, you know, I was in the deer woods, and I ran into this guy named Benny Rinaldi. And he proceeded. He asked me a question. He'd always ask this question. You got a minute. And if you said yes... He proceeded to tell you what Jesus had done for him. And person after person, he led me to the Lord in the woods. We, I happened to be on a fishing boat, and we, you know, and it was just one thing after the other. Kmart, you know, red, aisle five, blue light special. Jesus is, you know, I mean, he led people to the Lord all over. Did his he, the, So the stuff he did didn't change, but his mindset of doing it. Now he was doing it as a representative, as an ambassador of heaven, and he was doing it, one, in faith. He believed in his God, and he knew him, and he believed that there was a reward waiting for him, and he believed he wanted everybody that he could to go with him. And so he, he and my dad, they joined teams, and my daddy got saved first. And they said, you know what? Our lives, we're not going to give any of our family a reason not to love Jesus and to come to Jesus. So guess what? They continued to live their life, but now they structured and everything they did, they did it with a forethought, what does this look like to our family? What does this sound like to our family? Are we doing anything? And see, folks, that's holiness, is when you begin to be so God-conscious and loving others conscious that Everything you do now begins to be flavored 
by that. And then your friendship, with the, the, the way you look at the world and the things you value the world, all begin to be flavored. And see, so faith produces obedience. Obedience is going to produce love and holiness and the fruits of the Spirit in your life, and that's going to produce more faith, and it's just a, it's a circular thing. And then when you finally make it across the line, you get to hear, well done, good faith. And that should be our goal. And, and the flip side of that is there's another scary portion of Scripture in 1 Corinthians that says that there will be those, Brother Jerry, that will be saved but only as escaping the that everything they have done will pass through the fire and it will be consumed. And they will stand before their Savior at that moment of full realization of what he did for them. And they will see the scars and they will have now an understanding of what he did to purchase their salvation. And they will be empty-handed. That possibility, because see, that when once you get saved, that becomes Satan's will for you. He doesn't have your soul anymore, but he wants to get you to heaven empty-handed. And so he will do everything he can with the love of the world and unholiness and, and get you off, even with doctrines and stuff in the church, to get you to not be fruitful and not to produce fruits unto eternity. And folks, that, that thought of that moment of standing before him when the elders are there throwing their crowns and people are throwing, laying down before him the crowns and, and, and what they've produced in life, and you'd be standing there empty-handed. That would be a horrible moment. We'll be glad we made it, but it says you're going to smell like smoke. I don't want to. How about y'all? So ask the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray right now and just say, Holy Spirit, teach me that. Holy Spirit, teach us. I just pray for your people tonight. They, they, every person here desires to walk in, in your goodness, to walk in your favor, to walk in your blessing, to walk in fruitfulness. They want their lives to count and to matter. So Holy Spirit, I just pray you begin to, 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 un, uh, to, to reveal to them what true faith and what a faith walk looks like. Not all this stuff we hear, but what real faith, what real God-honoring, Father-honoring faith. Father, that, that they begin to, to love you and to love your people and to love those that you so love that you sent your son to die for them and that they begin to love as, and, and treat others and to, to, as, as they would desire to be loved and treated. And they begin to show what true Christians look like. Father, teach us what, what that looks like, to love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and body, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Help that to just become a guiding force in our life that determines how we do and what we value and, and what we value in this world. And Father, that we never find ourselves at enmity with you because we have latched on or put something in this world ahead of loving you and loving those that your son died. Father, we, just, we, we come against legalism. We come against fruit, fruitless thinking, and we just ask for the abundant life that our Savior died to give us in this life that that truly abundant life would be manifested through your Holy Spirit in your people. We just give you all the honor and the praise and the glory tonight, Father, and we just commit our ways to this process of learning faith, learning holiness, not loving this world. Work that in us, Father, we pray. We ask for that grace to be deposited into us tonight the name of your son, and for his glory. Amen. Mm. Chris got hold of me a few months ago and told me he was going to be coming through.
and uh, he's going to uh, be heading back to Ecuador. Why are you going to Ecuador? Well, because there's a people there that I've been called to, to deposit, to deposit what I just deposited in you, and that's why, I, you know, all the years I've come here, I don't think I ever preached a missions message. I always felt, I said, you know what, I'm going to feed the folks when I'm here. I'm not going to tell you mission stories. I'm going to preach a sermon, and if you think it was a benefit to you, that's what Ecuadorians are getting, same thing. So if, uh, if, if, if you felt this was relevant to your life tonight, well, guess what? I just spent a whole month preaching that sermon, or it, and I had a little longer. So in some of these churches, I, I started with point one, and each, time, each visit I've been going back and hitting two and three. And uh, because I, I just believe this is, th these three points tonight really are key, uh, key, key for folks. And because and, uh, the church, you know, I grew up in legalism, and it didn't produce any life in me. You know, I was always just, it made me sin conscious, and I was never, it was just, it was fearful, fear-based, and, 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 you know, and you get depressed about yourself, measuring yourself, and it just didn't didn't produce any life. And as I've really got a hold of what the, the word has said, I, I want other people to be free to serve the Lord in joy and, and, and enjoy the process. I mean, uh, and, but you got to do it the right way. Amen. Do y'all enjoy it? We enjoy life, don't we? Man, I like the, the balance this house has and the things we do. I was thinking about Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 today of faith. You know, that now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And how many times we want to see something before we, we believe it, you know. It's backwards. It's, I, I just, I love Hebrews 11. I mean, if I was doing something tonight, I would just take that whole chapter and we would walk through it. Because, uh, Stephen, I think you've been reading Hebrews. You just found, I love that, man. You just found the Bible. It's like. Oh, Samson and Barak, and he just goes through. Yeah. Come on. Come on. And they did not see what we've seen. They did it without the cross. And, and they died without seeing it. Yeah. The, the other thing I was thinking is Sister Lori and I watched a little uh, series or a little show about uh, uh, other countries and surrogate mothers and things. It was called Traffic, and it really bothered me how blessed we are here and how, how you see the homes in Guatemala, you see the homes in the um, uh, northern or uh, Istanbul. I'm trying to remember all the places they were talking about, but they're just stacked on top of each other, you know. And I know, Kevin, you're going to be going to Guatemala here in a few months. We're going to send you down to build houses. If you don't know that, we've got five folk we're going to send down to build some homes. And, uh, but, but a lot of times they're stacked. And look at us. We got home. We got two people living in, you know, uh, five, two thousand nothing, three, four, five thousand square foot, buying homes with four bedrooms in it, and just two people because he's got to have an office. You got to. You know, I'm thinking, Lord Jesus, and 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 a lot of that's gonna go through the fire. It's gonna go right through the fire, and uh, you'll thank God you made it. But that's not the point. I don't want to get to heaven thinking I just made it. I want to get to heaven screaming, you know, that. And hopefully, before I die, I'm able to give up more stuff and let go of more things. And bless more people. And again, uh, if God can get it through you, he'll get it to you. But the issue is you've got to be faithful stewards for what he gets to you. And uh, so the blessing here tonight is that God is going to bless you so you can bless others. That's why he did Abraham. Blessed Abraham so he could bless others. Uh, I, I know tonight, being a small group, I still want to take up an offering because we got to. I, 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 Chris is going to be making about four trips to Ecuador this year. And I, I want to be a part of one of those trips to get him back down there for the and I understand about 30 days you're going to be staying there and, and working. And uh, he's out of Tulsa. We just talked about that because that's where our daughter is when she gets off her mission trip. So if I could get a little help here. Real fast, uh, tell me about Saturday, Kevin. What do you think about it? Steven, you were there, weren't you? What do you think about it? Huh? You have plenty of people to talk to. Did you say, got a minute? And then you lied. That's what everybody does. They lie. You got a minute, then they lie. Amen. 
Yeah, so I want to give you time to get an offering envelope out. This is not this is over and above your tithe. Remember that. I know I've got some wealthy people in the house right now. So and those that are watching online, and if uh, uh, you're giving toward this moment to, to send him to uh, uh, back to Ecuador. And, of course, we'll have service again tomorrow night over in New Caney. But I, I appreciate the missionaries often come through here because of a conference over in Pasadena that I've been a part of. I've even preached it in years gone past. So it's, uh, it's good to have them come through. I'll try to communicate with as many as I can. But I thank God for our missions. I think, and I'm going to tell you something. Kevin, it's going to change your life to go to Guatemala. Once you leave this country and go to another country, you have a deep appreciation for this house when you get back and for this country. Hey, man, you're going to get it in the back? Uh, just stand in the back. We'll get it on the way out. Okay? Does that work? Okay. We'll pick it up on the way out. Uh, hey, hey, Je Justin, you wanted to skeet shoot. Yeah, he did cheat, didn't he? <laughs> I just want to say it, man. I mean, well, you know, I, I, first off, I get over to Sister Sheila to get Connor there because Connor is, is, you know, he's on his way, actually, literally as a teenager to be professional with it. I mean, he's really good. Really love Connor. Love his spirit, his attitude. He doesn't get shaken much. And, and these young eyes of these young people back here shooting, man, they're so quick to do it. And uh, are, are we filming right now? Okay, let me just say this, and I want you to cut the film, okay? Okay. Uh, if you would like to give, go to holywild.net slash give and give. just put missions on it. We'll make sure this gets to Chris so that we can bless him on his travels. We love you and good night.